Hi everyone, today I wanna to share with you um, sort of an interesting thing that's come up in the last couple of weeks while thinking about um, uh, simplifying an aspect of GHC's constraint solver. Uh, so uh, uh, those of you who've been watching this video, these videos have known that uh, I'm, I'm on a crusade, uh, now joined by, by intern Sam Derbyshire, um, uh, on a crusade to get rid of derived constraints. Uh, I think that they are uh, uh, add complication. Things have been slowed down. There's been quite a few papers that I've been working on. Um, but that's all done now, so I can really get back to this. I'm very excited about it. Um, but in the process of getting rid of these derived constraints, I've found that uh, the way that GHC infers types is going to have to change a little bit. So we're going to explore in this video a couple of sort of thorny edge case examples of how actually I expect um, uh, inferred types to change between now and GHC 9.4. Uh, so let's dive in. So this, this example here, we have um, an outer function and an inner function. Um, so this outer function, uh, it takes, for, for some type Q, um, it's going to give me back a list of Qs, and it does this by calling this inner function, which takes this first argument x and puts it in a list with five. So not the most interesting function, but, but there's some interesting behavior here. So I put a colon colon underscore here so that GHC will report back to me what type we infer for the inner type. This is a partial type signature. So I've enabled the partial type signatures extension, um, and we'll see why we need type families and scope type variables in a minute. Uh, we don't yet actually, the current program does not need those. So if I try to load this, uh, first off, it gets accepted. We see OK1 module loaded at the bottom here. Um, but then we can go back and see that this underscore, it really stands for the type Q to list of Q. And that makes sense here, right? Because lists always have to have all the same elements in them. And so X here is this X there, which has this type Q. And so Y has to have the same type. So this inner one has to have that same type Q. Um, okay, so that's not really a surprise. But I want to write down a different type signature for inner than the one that was inferred. I want to type in this type signature. And now, does that work? It does. And so for this, we need type families and scope type variables. We need scope type variables so that this Q is in scope down here. Right? Without scoped type variables, then these two Qs would be considered unrelated and we'd get an error. Um, and we need type families for the twiddle. Um, so this is a bit of a weird thing. There's no type families in this code, but we need type families to, to use a type equality. So this type signature works because I'm saying that inner is going to take something of type T, um, but T has to be equal to Q. Um, so uh, this is sort of a funny kind of polymorphism. We're going to say this inner works for any T as long as T equals Q. So it's not really polymorphic. Um, uh, but this type signature does work because when we're checking to see does the type of x match the type of y, well, the type of x is q, the type of y is t, but t equals q, so these things match up. It's all good. Um, the reason GHC doesn't infer this type, let's, well, let me take a step back there. When we're looking at this, what GHC is going to do is it's going to say, at this point, x has type q. We know x has type q. Um, and, and now let's say we don't have a type signature for inner. We'll go back to this inferring state. We're going to say that y is going to have some type alpha. So we know that x has type q, y has some type alpha, where we don't know what alpha is going to be. Um, and then doing this, whoops, I didn't mean that. Um, when we see this, we say, oh, OK, everything in the list has to have the same type. So that means that alpha must equal q. So we're going to call that a wanted constraint um, because we want to prove it. Um, now, at this point, GHC has a choice. Right? It could just say alpha equals Q, because I said we don't know what alpha is. Or maybe GHC is considering doing something like this inner type, where alpha becomes this fresh type variable T, and we just assume that T equals Q. Either of these is correct. Um, so part of what goes into, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit just to make sort of a, a slightly easier example here, but part of what goes into this is that GHC has to figure out when it has a constraint like this, does it want to quantify over it? In other words, include that constraint in the list of constraints of the inferred type, or does it want to try to sort of not do that and solve the constraint instead? One of the ways that GHC decides not to quantify this is, is one of these unification variables, is that determined by something outside, right? This Q isn't part of inner, it's part of outer. It's something that the, uh, the type inference for inner cannot affect. And yet, because we have alpha equals Q, 
it doesn't make sense for alpha to um, to be sort of locally quantified, right? Q is gonna tell us what alpha is. So if alpha ends up as this T thing that's local to inner, that's kind of strange, right? We can't, it, it means we're gonna end up in this situation where we have polymorphism, where we really don't have polymorphism, right? In that we're gonna have a type variable that's fully determined by some outer type variable. GHC says, no, we don't allow that. We look at all the type variables that sort of come from outside, anything determined by those type variables um, is then not quantified. So this anything determined by, right now the way that works is just by looking at these equality constraints. But the way that this derived patch works, it's a little bit of a long story to tell all the details, but the way that this derived patch works um, is instead of looking just at equality constraints, we really wanna look at all functional dependencies. And so that means because this current behavior only affects equality constraints, but we want it for all functional dependencies uh, because it's sort of hard to differentiate between equalities and, and, and fund depths after we get rid of derives. Um, again, sort of a long story to explain why that is. Um, then we're gonna see some changes elsewhere. So let's go look at another example, which is thankfully a little bit simpler um, than this equal one. So that is flexible. Um, okay, so let's walk through this. We have a class CAB here where we have a functional dependency that A determines B. And then some operator op with this type. And this is just sort of a convenient setup so that I can easily control A and B at call sites. Um, right, so this functional dependency, it means that as soon as I know A, I should really know also what B is. And now I'm gonna try to infer the type of a function foo, um, where the body of foo just calls op at true x. So this true, tells us that A is going to be bool, but I haven't said anything at all about what X should be. Um, so when I compile this, this is 810 running in the bottom left. When I compile this in 810 and I ask for what the type of foo is, then I get this inferred type um, that we have, we quantify over C bool B. This is one of this, this, this cases where we just put it in the inferred type. And then we take some argument of type B and it goes to unit, right? That's because unit is the result of op. Not useful at all. But, but a good sort of type inference puzzle. What's strange about this type is that I said earlier that because there's a functional dependency from A to B, as soon as I know A, then I should know B. And so down here, where I've inferred bool, then that also tells me what B must be, right? This functional dependency means, for example, that I can't have instance C bool int and instance C bool car. If I do that, I'm gonna get an error. Functional dependencies conflict. So that means, going back to our original case here with foo, that means that this type, this inferred type for foo is a bit silly. This is for all B, such that B is the thing that is functionally de determined by bool, which we don't really know what it is yet, but it's only going to be one thing. This polymorphism has very much the flavor that we saw earlier. It looks like it's polymorphic, but there's really only gonna be one choice for B that's ever good here. Um, so I think it's reasonable to say, let's not do this. Let's not quantify over B. So in the bottom right corner, I have a patch uh, 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 of GHC that doesn't have derived in it um, and indeed does not quantify over B. Um, so if I load, what is it called, flexible, then I get no instance for C bool B0, right? GHC doesn't want to quantify over this because it's not real polymorphism. We say B is fixed by everything that we already know. And so we're not going to quantify over it at all. And instead, we're just going to issue an error. Now, just like before, I could write a type signature that quantifies over it. The same is true now. So if I really want this type, I could write it. And then both yesterday and tomorrow it works. Um, so, uh, so we're not really reducing expressiveness, but what's gonna be better for users? Should we infer polymorphism where it doesn't really exist? Or should we be a little bit more honest and upfront and say, mm, nah, this is something funny going on here. So I'm quite pleased with this change. It wasn't what I set out to do, but it just sort of fell out naturally from cleaning things up internally. So looking at this, uh, you, get a, you get a bit of an idea of, of, of the kinds of, of challenges that we have when, when working on patches in GHC. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.